Good evening and welcome. I'm thrilled to introduce Dennis Ross, an academic, a practitioner, an author, ambassador, and diplomat. Mr. Ross has dedicated his life to public service in both Republican and Democratic uh, administrations from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama. He is a counselor and distinguished fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and has served two years as a special assistant to President Obama and National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region as well as a special advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping US involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealt directly with the parties in negotiations. A highly skilled diplomat, Ambassador Ross was the US point man on the peace process during both George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton's administrations. He was, an integral, he was integral in assisting Israelis and Palestinians to reach the 1995 interim agreement. He also successfully brokered the 1997 Hebron Accord and facilitated the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. He has since worked to improve relations between Israel and Syria. Ross is also the author of several influential books on the peace process, with his most recent book, Doomed to Succeed, about U.S.-Israeli ties gaining recognition as the 2015 National Jewish Book Award recipient for history. Dennis's remarks will be followed by a Q&A with the audience, and with that, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dennis Ross. So, thank you. I like to walk and talk uh, when I speak. I also, I teach at Georgetown and I find that when I'm walking and talking, more things kind of occur to me. Although I have to admit, I did get a Fitbit uh, nine months ago and I'm not quite at my steps total today, so walking and talking is also driven by my preoccupation with exercise, although this is not real exercise. But anyway, I'll, I'll walk and talk. Um, <clears throat> it is true that I was a political appointee for two Republican presidents and two Democratic presidents. I was a political appointee for President Reagan, a political appointee for the first President Bush, and for Bill Clinton, I was his negotiator in the Middle East, and for Barack Obama. And people are always amazed when they, when they hear that, well, you know, how could you be a political appointee for two Republicans and two Democrats, right? I mean, for most people, that makes me an extinct species. My answer is, I spent 30 years working with Arabs and Israelis. So how hard can it be to work with Republicans and Democrats? <laughs> As it turns out, harder than you might think. <laughs> right, so I want to, tonight, I want to talk about the challenges that the Trump administration faces in the Middle East. And I'm going to start with a statement. Every president from Truman to Obama faced at least one major war and or one major crisis, every single one. And yet, President Trump faces a more daunting environment than any of his predecessors. I'm going to repeat that. Every single president from Truman to Obama faced at least one major war and one major crisis. And what I just said was that, and yet, what Trump faces is more daunting than any of his predecessors. Let's just take a, let's survey the region so you get a sense of this. The state system itself is under assault in the Middle East, which has not been the case before. We have several states that will never be put back together again. Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya will probably never be whole again. You look at the war in Syria, you have half a million dead, more than a million wounded, 13 million out of a population of 23 million displaced, 5 million of those refugees outside the country, 8 million displaced within the country living in conditions that are hard to imagine. You have a war against Assad, and you have a war against ISIS. We, the US position, has been, for the most part, to focus on ISIS, not on Assad. Right now, to add to the, the scope of the difficulties that we face, we have, we have been arming the Kurdish People's Protection Unit, also known as the YPG, 
They have been the most effective fighters that we have had when it comes to dealing with ISIS. And we've been arming them. And Turkey has intervened and created what is, in fact, a safe zone uh, in Syria. Why did they do it? I like to stop and pose questions. So, And the one thing you can count on is every question I pose, I can answer. <laughs> so why do you think Turkey has intervened the way they have? Yeah. So are they, did they intervene primarily because of ISIS or because of the Kurds? Right. So they intervened at a point when it looked like there might be a contiguous corridor in Syria along the Turkish border, and they saw that as linking up with the PKK. So what you have today is you have us being poised to go after Raqqa. One of the things, I, I will bring you up to date. We have just deployed a marine unit into Syria uh, that is there to help with, uh, in a sense, not only working with uh, helicopters to attack Raqqa, but to, in a sense, be the spotters and to direct the artillery. We're moving heavy guns into position to be able to help with the assault on Raqqa. Now, we're still backing the YPG. Turkey says, no, they shouldn't be the ones to go into Raqqa. We should be the ones to go into Raqqa. Why? Because they don't want there to be this corridor. So A, we have to manage the issue of Turkey uh, and the Kurds. B, we've also seen now by the way, after we have softened up Raqqa, we've now seen the Russians with the Iranians and the Syrian regime also positioning themselves to move into Raqqa. We have moved forces into an area called Mandri because we wanted to ensure there wasn't a conflict between the Turks and the Kurds, but also there wasn't conflict between the Iranian Shia militias that have been brought in uh, and the uh, and the Kurds, and the Turks. So here we are. We're trying to deal with the issue of ISIS and to remove them out of Raqqa. We are not really dealing, as I said, with the war against Assad. There is a tenuous ceasefire right now uh, that was brokered by the Russians with the Turks with some Iranian involvement. It is tenuous because it is observed in some places and not observed in others. It is highly unlikely that it will last, because fundamentally, Assad has killed too many Syrians for the opposition to ever live with any long-term presence of Assad. So there will be an ongoing insurgency uh, in Syria. There will be the struggle for removing ISIS, which we'll probably succeed in relatively soon. And then what we will face is what comes after ISIS in Raqqa. If the aftermath of ISIS in Raqqa is a vacuum, well, we've seen what happens with vacuums in Syria and Iraq. If the aftermath are the Shia militias playing a role, well, we've seen what they've done. Everywhere they have appeared, young Sunni males have disappeared. What created the emergence of ISIS in the first place? the exclusion, alienation, brutalization of the Sunnis. So if in the aftermath of Raqqa we don't have a plan to create inclusion, governance, and security, and reconstruction, the prospect of getting son of ISIS during the lifetime of the Trump administration will be a fairly high prospect. OK, so if it were only Syria, with what I just described, that would probably be enough, right? That would be enough of a challenge for the administration. But it's not only Syria. What's going on right now in, in Iraq with Mosul? You know, here, the Iraqi military is making very difficult but continual progress, is moving increasingly towards being able to take over Mosul. Shia militias are not in the city where the military is but they're in surrounding areas. Uh, and everywhere where they are, they repeat the pattern that we've seen before. 
The Shia militias are run by the Iranians, the Quds forces. They deepen sectarianism. As I said, oftentimes you see the young Sunni males disappear in Ramadi, in Fallujah, uh, and even in Tikrit. When they played a major role, young Sunni males simply disappeared. So if you don't have a plan, again, for what comes after in Mosul, if what you see again is the exclusion of Sunnis, the absence of governance, no reconstruction, no security for Sunnis, the very factors that produced ISIS in the first place will be recreated. So Syria would be enough by itself. Syria and Iraq together, definitely be beyond maybe what any other administration has faced. But that's not the sum total of what we face in the region. In Yemen, there is a proxy war that goes on, basically a proxy war between the Saudis and the Iranians. About six weeks ago, the Saudi king gave a speech and said, we will not allow the Iranians to establish uh, a proxy force on our border. He was referring to the Houthis. Now, there's a lot of places in the world you don't want to fight. I would say the first is Yemen, the second is Yemen, and the third is Yemen. But there's a fight there. And why is it important? Well, because actually there's a strait there. A significant percentage of the world's energy passes through the Bab al Mandeb. Everybody thinks about the Strait of Hormuz, but this goes through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. And what have the Houthis been doing? Well, they've been firing missiles at ships. Today, there were stories about mines in the Bab al Mandeb. Very hard for us not to somehow be engaged in that as well. So you've got the Yemen conflict to have to deal with. You have Egypt. I don't know how many of you saw, but the Egyptians made a decision to scale back the amount of government bread that would be supplied. And it's produced, today, it has produced uh, demonstrations in five different governments, including in Cairo, led by women. Now, a short while ago, before the Egyptians got an IMF standby loan, they had a shortage of cooking oil, rice, and sugar. Sound like a prescription for stability? It's a rhetorical question. Egypt is a country of 94 million. If Egypt were to become a failed or a failing state, it would make what happened in Syria look like child's play. <clears throat> and look what the consequence of Syria was. The flow of refugees from Syria contributed to Brexit, contributed to what we've seen in terms of populist policies in Europe. Think about Egypt and 94 million people if it becomes a failed or a failing state. If you're only dealing with Egypt and the need to ensure it doesn't become a failed or a failing state, that would be enough. To create more of a strategy to help change the character of the Egyptian economy will require a collective effort. It will require intensive diplomacy to put together what is basically the Gulf states with the Europeans, the international finance institutions, and ourselves. And then being able to present it to the Egyptian government and President Sisi in a way that doesn't look like a diktat so that Egyptian dignity isn't so riled up that there's a resistance to this. It's going to take a serious, thoughtful, diplomatic effort to contend with that. All right, so I've gone through Syria. I've gone through Iraq. I've gone through Yemen. I've gone through Egypt. I haven't mentioned Libya. And that's because I don't want you all rushing out of here and buying Prozac, OK? So Libya is basically a collection of militias right now, more than it is a state. Collectively, these are really daunting challenges. And collectively, they basically are more complicated than what we've seen with previous administrations. So is it all hopeless? Pregnant pause. No, there actually are two developments that create assets right now that also haven't existed before. One of them actually is what's going on in Saudi Arabia. There is a national transformation plan uh, in Saudi Arabia. 
I went there and I met the whole leadership at the end of August. One of the senior ministers said to me, welcome to our revolution disguised as economic reform. They are trying to transform the country. They are seeking to overhaul the entire educational system and all the textbooks within the next two years. They want to replace the textbooks with digital tablets, which is not just significant in terms of changing what's in the textbooks. It's significant because they're trying to make it interactive. Education in Saudi Arabia has always been by rote. It never produced a focus on critical thinking or questioning. So this begins to create a very different approach. They have taken the power of the religious police away so the religious police can no longer arrest, interrogate, uh, or hold uh, anybody on the street. The religious police are no longer allowed to go into the malls. They are trying to take Aramco, the Saudi national oil company, public. You know what that means? To take it and as an offer, do an IPO, initial public offering? What do you think that means? Well, what it means is it can't be the royal family's private piggy bank because you have to create transparency. Now, what I'm describing, and I haven't, I'm not describing everything. One of the people, I, by the way, that I met when I was there was the Minister of Entertainment. I mean, think about it, the Minister of Entertainment. Why was I meeting the Minister of Entertainment? Because over $200 billion a year flows out of Saudi Arabia because people have nothing that they can do. And so they want people to stay, and they want people to be able to you know, have places to go. What's going on here will for sure face opposition internally. Within the religious establishment, there'll be opposition. Within parts of the royal family, there will be opposition. So the success of this is not a given. But its significance and why we have a stake in it is hard to exaggerate. And the reason I say that is there has never been a successful model of development in the Arab world. Think about that. Never been a successful model of development or modernization in the Arab world, which is the reason that you've had a constant stream of pretenders for who is going to produce progress, who is going to produce greatness lost. Put this in perspective. Egypt had the same GDP as South Korea in 1960. And today, South Korea has the GDP of all the Arab countries combined. The fact that you've had a constant stream of pretenders, they were secular nationalists like Nasser, who was going to produce and restore greatness. You know, Gaddafi claimed the same. Saddam Hussein claimed the same. They were all secular nationalists. Then you had the Muslim Brotherhood said, Islam is the answer. Islam is the solution. ISIS is claiming we will perfect Islam. But how are they going to reconcile Islam with modernity when they want to turn the clock back to the seventh century? They're all pretenders. None of them had a plan. But it left a profound yearning within the region. It, it left a profound sense of being left behind in the region. And that's why there's a constant appeal to find someone who has an answer. Well, if the Saudis actually succeed in this, then it means there actually is a model of development in the region that works. So we have a stake in their success. That's a new potential asset. Now there's a second new potential asset. And that is that there is a level of cooperation between the Israelis and the Sunni Arab states that has never existed before. I want to put this in perspective also. You know, one of the things I did in, the, in my book doomed to succeed, the U.S.-Israeli relationship from Truman to Obama, I went through every administration and looked at their policies, the assumptions that drove those policies, how they viewed the area, and the like. In 1981, Alexander Haig, when he was Secretary of State, when he became Secretary of State, he said there's a strategic alignment, a strategic realignment in the region. And he said the Israelis and the Arabs see a threat from Iran, understand in 1981, this was not long after the Islamic Revolution uh, in Iran, they see a strategic threat from Iran, and they see a threat from the Soviet Union. And that creates a strategic consensus. Now, what he was saying was true in the abstract, but it wasn't true in practice. There wasn't cooperation then, but today there is. 
Today, there is a shared sense of threat perception. The Gulf states look at Iran as their most, I would say, an existential threat. Egypt and Jordan are dealing with ISIS type of threats. Each sees Israel as a natural partner. And the level of cooperation between them is unprecedented. But it's also below the radar screen. Why is it below the radar screen? It's real, but it's not visible. It's unprecedented in terms of its scope, and in terms of military, security, intelligence, cooperation. But no one broadcasts it. Why? I want someone else. You answer the last one. This is how I do it in my class, too. Why? Why? OK, why? Right. It's, as long as the Palestinian issue is out there, it's not going to change the fact of their cooperation, but it prevents it from being visible and from them elevating it. So on the one hand, it's a completely new asset that has never existed before. Because the scope of the cooperation is really quite remarkable. Actually, one of the reasons it emerged was because of President Obama. Not because he drove it by design, but because both the Israelis and the Arab states felt that President Obama, rightly or not, looked at Iran as being the source of a solution to the problems in the region. And they both looked at Iran as being the source of the problems in the region. And it drove them together. So you have an asset. That asset can be useful in terms of countering the Iranians and their, the Iranian use of Shia militias. When I made a reference to the Shia militias before, and I talked about Syria before, the Iranians have brought from as far away as Afghanistan militia personnel that total over 75,000 to Syria. These are all Shia militias. The Sunni Arab states look at the Shia militias as being a specific threat against them. So cooperation with Israel is a counter to Iran and the Shia militias. Cooperation with Israel is a counter to the threats from ISIS types of groups for Egypt and Jordan. And the United States can take advantage of that in terms of developing its strategy for the region in the Trump administration. Now, it can also potentially take advantage of it between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And there's, in a sense, a need now for an Arab cover from two different perspectives. First, the Palestinians are too weak, too divided, with positioning for succession after Abu Mazen to be able to do anything in terms of negotiations with the Israelis. Negotiations with Israel today are seen as a concession. So if even talking to Israel is seen as a concession, if you could bring them to the table, do you think they could make concessions? That's also a rhetorical question. If they're going to engage with the Israelis, they need some kind of cover, and they need some kind of cover to assume responsibility for whatever is done there. But Israel needs it too. Today, the level of disbelief on, on both sides is so great that in the case of the Israelis, they think if you made a concession to the Palestinians, you get nothing in return for it. So they don't want to make a concession to the, to the Palestinians, but they could if they were getting something in return from it from the Arabs. So the Palestinians need a cover, but the Israelis also need a cover. The question is, do the Arab states have enough of an incentive to be involved? The Gulf states are preoccupied with Iran. They're not preoccupied with the Palestinians. Egypt and Jordan pay more attention to the Palestinians for obvious reasons. In the case of Jordan, a significant part of its population is Palestinian. What happens in the West Bank has all sorts of reverberations within Jordan. In the case of Egypt, you know, the, the relationship between Hamas and the ISIS groups within the Sinai is one that is a real one, and the Egyptians see as a threat. In addition, President Sisi would like to establish, again, Egypt's broader role in the region, and maybe doing something on peace could be useful here. So the Gulf states may not have an interest in it. Egypt and Jordan may have an interest in it. The question is, how could you create a kind of collection of the Sunni Arab states to play a role here? And here, there's an interesting paradox. And I'm going to use a term called reverse linkage. Historically, and I'll come back to this in few minutes. 
historically there was a sense that the only conflict in the region that mattered was the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Solve that, and you end all conflict in the region. That was the view. And that was the concept of linkage. The Palestinian issue has linked every other issue. Reverse linkage that I'm raising with you relates to the key thing that the main Sunni Arab states are looking for is an American engagement to deal with the threats that they're most concerned about. If they thought the only way to draw the US in to play that kind of a role was to address the Israeli-Palestinian issue because that's what the Trump administration was interested in, then they would be prepared to act on this issue. But it doesn't mean they're prepared to act on the issue and, they, and it's a freebie, meaning it doesn't mean you bring them in and they solve the Palestinian issue. If you bring them in to play this role, and they're prepared to do it because this is the way they think they draw the Trump administration in, so that the Trump administration isn't a replay of what they saw with Obama. With Obama, they saw a retreat from the region. Whether it was real or not, that's what they saw. For them to play a role in the Palestinians is not only to draw Trump in. For them to play a role in the Palestinians, they also have to show what they produce for the Palestinians. They have to show they delivered for the Palestinians what the Palestinians could not deliver for themselves, which means, in the end, while they might be prepared to reach out to the Israelis, though while they might be prepared to press the Palestinians, they will require something from the Israelis on the Palestinian issue. The good news is they may well be prepared to play a role they've never played before. I can tell you, when we went to Camp David in the summer of 2000, and we wanted Arab support, it wasn't there. They said to us what was typically the line, whatever the Palestinians agree to, we'll agree to. Well, if the Palestinians aren't prepared to agree to anything, well, that means nothing's going to happen. And that's what happened in the summer of 2000. Now, they may be prepared to play a different kind of role. But it doesn't come cheaply. It doesn't come simply. And it doesn't come without the Israelis, in the end, addressing it with a Palestinian coin for them. What the Israelis get in return is a kind of outreach uh, from the Arabs. The question is, at this point, do the Arabs and the Israelis have the same view of what they expect from the other? And the short answer is no, they don't. The Israelis, to take steps towards the Palestinians, will require much more of an outreach from the Arabs. And the Arabs, at this point, think they would have to give. Uh, and what the Arabs require from the Israelis on the Palestinian issue is much more than what the Israelis are probably prepared to give. But this is where creative diplomacy comes in. And that will be a question for the Trump administration. So on the one hand, you have a very daunting environment in the region. On the other hand, you have two new assets that didn't exist before. And the key is up to the Trump administration, can they act on this? Now, one thing they have to recognize are, what are the key priorities of Arab leaders? And here, historically, this is not something that the administrations from Truman to Obama have been very good at. One of the things I outline in my book is that embedded in the national security apparatus were three assumptions. And from Truman to Obama, not always with equal weight in every administration, but from Truman to Obama, Three assumptions were embedded in the national security apparatus, and I would say they're probably still embedded in the apparatus below the political level. One was, if you distance from Israel, you'll gain with the Arabs. The corollary was, if you cooperate with Israel, you'll lose with the Arabs. And the third was, you can't change the region or the American position in it unless you solve the Palestinian issue. Now, the first two assumptions were demonstrably wrong over time but the lessons were never learned. Five administrations consciously distanced from Israel with an expectation that they would gain with the Arabs. Eisenhower distance, Nixon distance, Carter distance, the first Bush distance, and Obama distance. In none of those cases did they gain what they thought they would gain. The truth is, none of them gained anything at all. The corollary to that, by the way, as I said, was if you cooperate with Israel, you lose with the Arabs. And those 
administrations that made a conscious choice to do something that was cooperating with the Israelis didn't pay a price. One interesting example, in 1963, we were providing $44.5 million worth of arms to five Arab states. In 1968, after the 1967 war, we were providing $995 million worth of arms to those same Arab states. Many within the administration, after the Six-Day War, after 1967, thought, well, the Arabs are going to distance themselves from us because basically we didn't oppose the Israelis. And unlike what Eisenhower had done, Eisenhower demanded Israel withdraw after the 56 war from the Sinai Desert. He threatened sanctions against Israel. He threatened expulsion from the UN unless the Israelis withdrew from the Sinai. Johnson said, I'm not going to do what Eisenhower did. If the Israelis are going to get out, they have to get something for it. They have to get peace for it. The principles that he outlined actually on June 19, 1967, later became mainly embodied in November in, the, in Resolution 242. So the image, in fact, this was a view within the administration, we're going to pay with the Arabs because of the position Johnson adopted. But did we? All those countries that were buying arms from us, they wanted more arms from us. Why? Because it created the American connection to them. Why? Because it was connected to their security. An earlier example, I said Kennedy was, the first, Kennedy was the first administration to sell arms to the Israelis. We didn't sell arms to the Israelis until the Kennedy administration. When Kennedy was contemplating selling the weapons to the, uh, to the Israelis, these were purely defensive weapons. They were Hawk anti-aircraft missiles, fixed. They couldn't move. They are good only against attacking aircraft. When he was contemplating this, he got cables from every one of our embassies in the Middle East. When I was researching this chapter, I went through all these cables. I referred to them as the chicken little cables. Because every one of them said, the sky will fall. It will be the end of our position in the Middle East if we do this. The same day it became known that we were going to provide these arms to the Israelis was the same day that Dean Rusk, who was the representative of those within the administration arguing against sale, having told the president, if we sell these arms, it'll, it'll be a terrible precedent. It'll and not only will it be a terrible precedent, it will cause grave damage to our position in the region. Same day it comes out about the sale, he's meeting the real leader of Saudi Arabia at the time, Crown Prince Faisal, who was the real leader at the time. And when he meets him in New York at the opening of the UN, what does he find? He finds that Faisal doesn't even raise the issue. What does Faisal raise? He raises the coup in Yemen, which he says, this is Nasser's effort to gain a foothold on the Arabian Peninsula to threaten us. We need American arms and American assurances. So the arms to Israel he doesn't raise, but these arms to Israel, which were supposed to destroy our position in the region, triggers a request for arms from us. A week later, he sees uh, President Kennedy in the Oval Office. A week later, you know, does he say, oh, I should have had a V8. What was I thinking? How could I not have raised that? How could I not have complained about it? Is that what he does? No. He doesn't raise the issue. What does he raise? At the beginning of the Kennedy administration, Kennedy came in, and he thought that Eisenhower's policy in the Middle East had been a disaster, that rather than keeping the Soviets out, he had brought them in. They were the main provider of arms to Egypt, to Syria, and Iraq. And he said, we're not going to compete with the Soviets in arms, but maybe I can appeal to Nasser by providing economic assistance. So the Kennedy administration, by the time of this meeting, was providing two-thirds of Egypt's bread supply. Uh, and what does Faisal say to the president? Faisal says to the president, your outreach to Egypt is the source of the problems of the threat that we face. Your economic assistance to Egypt is freeing up resources for Egypt to threaten all your friends and change the balance of power in the region. Sound familiar? What do you think President Obama was hearing from all the Arab states about the nuclear deal with Iran? What was their big complaint about it? Were they focused on the nuclear issue the way the Israelis were? No. They were focused on the fact that you're going to do this deal. It's going to come at our expense because you're going to lift sanctions. If Iran represents a threat to us when it's under sanctions, imagine the threat it's going to pose to us when they're no longer under sanctions. 
What did it reflect? It reflected what their basic priority was, security and survival. They were never going to make their relationship with us dependent on what we did with Israel because their preoccupation was their security and survival. Same thing today. The Trump administration, if it focuses on how to address their priority of security and survival, which means, by the way, they don't have to accept it, but they have to understand it. When President Obama went to last April, the end of last April, he went to the Gulf Cooperation Council Summit, the six Arab countries in the Gulf, Arabian Peninsula, who make up the Gulf, Co uh, Gulf Cooperation Council, he went to that summit and he, and he basically asked them to do more to fight ISIS, which was the right thing to do, because at the end of the day, to defeat ISIS, you need the Sunnis. ISIS claims to be the protector of the Sunnis. So you need the Sunnis. First, you need the Sunnis for the manpower to replace them. You need the Sunnis to help with reconstruction. You need the Sunnis to be the ones to discredit them. We can't discredit them. Only they can. He was right to ask. But what did they hear? The day after the summit, Abdul Rahman al-Rashid, who's managing director of Al-Arabiya, who is a journalist, uh, very well connected to the Saudi leadership, he writes an article the day after the summit. And what does he say? President Obama came here and asked us, to asked us to acquiesce in Iran's dominance in the region. You think that's what President Obama actually said to them? You think that's what he said? He didn't say that, but that's what they heard. Because their focus was Iran, and his focus was ISIS. Their focus was, who threatens us? Yeah, ISIS is a problem, but Iran is an existential threat. He wasn't addressing what mattered most to them. If you want to get them to play a larger role against ISIS, they have to see what you're prepared to do with them, not in place of them, on Iran and against the Shia militias. So taking advantage of the opportunities requires also knowing how to use your leverage and how to address them. That's something this administration will have to be able to do. Now, the third assumption, which I haven't addressed yet, but I'll wrap up with this, was that, again, you couldn't change the American position or the region itself unless you solve the Palestinian issue. Now, and I said that was an assumption that was wrong. Does it strike you as interesting that someone who spent 30 years trying to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue is saying to you that assumption was wrong? Do you find that somewhat paradoxical? Why would I spend all this time working on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and I'm still working on it? I didn't do it because I thought it was a game changer in the region. If tomorrow it ended, would it end the war in Syria? Would it change what's happening in Iraq? Would it stop what's happening in Yemen? Would it transform what's happening in Egypt or Libya? Obviously not. So why am I still so committed to it? Is it because, as my wife says, I ought to be committed? Perhaps. No, because at the end of the day, this is a conflict that if you care about Israel, you should want to end it. If you care about the Palestinians, you should want to end it. If you don't want Israel to become a binational state, you should want to end it. If you want to take what is an intractable conflict and show intractable conflicts can actually be addressed, you should want to end it. The problem today is we can't end it. The gaps between the parties are too great. The disbelief between the parties is too embedded now. But you can't set up an equation where the choice is, if we can't solve it, we'll do nothing. That's what help, has helped to contribute to where we are now. What's required now is take advantage of the fact that you do have this Israeli-Arab cooperation. Think about how to try to build on it so it creates a cover for both. But recognize the way you deal with this conflict is from the ground up and not just from the top down. We have to get back to the idea of restoring a sense of possibility. We have to get back to the idea of showing that something is possible. We have to show that things can actually change. On the Palestinian side, one of the focal points should be moving away from only symbols. 
It's a whole lot more important for the Palestinians to build the institutions of statehood than to have a flag at the UN. A flag at UN wins you applause for one day, and then the next day, the Palestinian public says, OK, what changed? And the answer is nothing. 80% of the Palestinian public today feels the Palestinian Authority is corrupt. Comparable percentages in Gaza feel the same way about Hamas. One of the reasons that I say you can't solve this today is no one has an answer to Gaza and Hamas. And Hamas rejects Israel's existence. Because for them, all of Palestine is part of an Islamic trust, none of which can be conceded. Until there's an answer to how you can deal also with Gaza, two states for two peoples is the right objective, but it's not something you can actually achieve. But if you stand pat and you do nothing, Israel becomes a binational state. So with the Palestinians, focus on building a state from the ground up. With the Israelis, focus on ensuring that, in fact, you preserve the possibility of two states for later on. If you believe in two states for later on, you don't build in the heart of what would be a Palestinian state. You don't build outside of the settlement blocks. Now, I told students earlier in answer to a question. In the year 2000, before we went to Camp David, when I was our lead negotiator, we came up with a formula for how you were going to deal with the borders. 67 and mutually agreed, mutually agreed swaps. What did that mean? It meant settlement blocks for swaps of territory. 80% of the Israeli settlers live on 4 to 5% of the West Bank, the 4 to 5% closest to the Green Line. If you build within the blocks, that's consistent with a two-state outcome. If you build outside the blocks, it's not consistent with a two-state outcome. For those who say you can have a one-state outcome, and there are Palestinians who say that, and there are Israelis who say that, and they're both wrong. You can have a one-state outcome. You just will have a one-state perpetual conflict. You have two national movements competing for the same space. You have two national identities. They will not coexist in one state. One will inevitably try to dominate the other. You look throughout the Middle East. When you find more than one identity, you find a place that's at war. Anyone who says, let's have one state for two people is saying, Let's have a perpetual conflict. So you have to keep the possibility of two states for two peoples alive. The right approach now is focus on the sources of disbelief and come up with ways to address it so that each side can demonstrate to the other, no, when we say we're for two states for two peoples, our actions reflect it. You know, on the Israeli side, one action that would reflect it would be don't build outside the blocks. Another action that would prove it would be to say there will be no Israeli sovereignty to the east of the security barrier. The barrier is on 8% of the West Bank. It means you're saying 92% of the West Bank, before we negotiate, there'll be no Israeli sovereignty there. On the Palestinian side, there are a lot of things they could do, one of which would be stop, stop paying the families of those who kill Israelis. Yesterday, there was a camp named, a uh, summer camp named for the, the Palestinian who carried out uh, a terrorist attack that killed 38 Israelis. Pretty hard to convince the Israeli public that, yeah, they're ready to accept us when you do that. Stop doing that. If you want the Israelis, if we were focused on how we do things more from the ground up, you focus on the Israelis not building outside the blocks, declaring no sovereignty to the east of area. You focus on the Palestinians doing things like making it clear they'll no longer make heroes of those who carry out acts of terror against Israelis. And maybe you can get them to put Israel on a map. You want to convince the Israeli public that they're serious about two states for two people? Put, show Israel on a map. In Palestinian Authority, you can't find Israel on a map. It's not impossible to make progress, because now you have this new asset with regard to the Arab states in Israel. But you have to focus both on the Arab role, and you also have to focus on what you do practically. If I were doing what I used to do, I'd be going to Arab leaders, and I would say, what would you need from the Israelis for you at this point to establish 
a public dialogue where you'd send a delegation, including Saudis and Emiratis, meaning those who don't have peace with Israel, to Israel to, have, to launch a dialogue on security arrangements, maybe under the rubric of the Arab Peace Initiative, but security arrangements for the region as a way of showing you are integrating Israel into this. What would you need from the Israelis for that? Vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And I'd be going to the Israelis and saying, you know, what would you be prepared to do if we could get the Arabs to take that step? Working from the top down and working from the bottom up, this is the way to transform the situation. You can't produce two states for two peoples now, but to allow your inability to produce that now to do nothing or to go again for a large initiative that can't be achieved will only deepen the despair and the disbelief. That's not the way to produce peace. I asked students earlier, why do they think that I entitled the book Doomed to Succeed? And I said to them, it wasn't only because it was a clever title, though it is a clever title. It was because this is a relationship that has evolved over time. It started at an unbelievably low ebb where basically the whole national security establishment was against the establishment of the state. It evolved over time because of shared interests and shared values. It evolved over time to today where given the conflict in the region which is over identity, you look at what I was describing throughout the region, the reason the conflicts are so bad is because they're so fundamental. Nothing is more basic than identity. And the conflict today between Islamists and non-Islamists, between Iranians and Saudis, between Sunni and Shia, they're all driven by who defines identity. This conflict won't go away soon. We have a stake in minimizing it because the Las Vegas rules don't apply to the Middle East. What takes place in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. If you believe otherwise, look at Syria and its impact on Europe. At the end of the day, we can't remain aloof from the Middle East, but we can be involved in the Middle East in an informed way. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try to show the lessons of the past so that it might guide what we do in the future. Why don't I stop there? I'll take questions. Lois, because I know you're shy. This is not a normal time. No, I know that. Um, so the kind of traditional outreach that you would have seen in the past certainly isn't taking place in the same way it has in the past. But there has been recently some outreach. Uh, part of it, you have to look at it. The administration, first of all, there's, doesn't have very many people in it. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it'll take a long time. You don't have a deputy secretary of state. You don't have an undersecretary of state. You don't have the assistant secretaries. Those who are in those positions are career people, not political appointees, career people. So almost by definition, there is a hesitancy to invest a whole lot in them. So it'll take time before you get a full range of appointments. Uh, and then we'll see. But there's been, yes, recently there's been some, some uh, outreach. And we'll see. I mean. Look, it's always been the case that just because there's some outreach or a lot of outreach, you can't, it's, it's not always easy to measure the impact. Uh, so we'll have to see. Um, stay tuned. Yes, I want to encourage students to ask questions. Yes.
investor population and support peace, let alone things that promote the intel, uh, how do you speak to that? Like, how do you really that? I think, look, I think it's, it's a really important question. Um, I think there should be an incentive, and the incentive is, if you're an Israeli, if you stay in the path you're on right now, Israel becomes a binational state. Uh, Israel got out of Gaza, so the numbers that some people use, they, they act as if Israel's still in Gaza. They're not in Gaza. Yeah, they control a lot that goes in, but so does Egypt. Egypt has a border that basically is closed. 800 trucks a day go from Israel into Gaza. You don't have anything going from Egypt in and out. So, you know, the, the, the issue with Israel being out of Gaza means when you look at the number of Israeli Jews who live in Israel and in the West Bank, you have about 6.5 million. If you look at the number of, of Israeli Arabs and Palestinians living in Israel and the West Bank, you have right now about 4.1 to 4.2 million. Do the math, and you're talking about like 62% to 38%. Now, the demographics will gradually move you not towards a Palestinian majority. The, the demographic numbers in the near term don't add up to a Palestinian majority. But you can ask yourself, what kind of a Jewish democratic state is it when it becomes 60-40, 58-42, 55-45? It's not a question of the point at which the Palestinians become a majority. When you have the numbers I'm describing even today, you become a binational state. The younger generation of Palestinians, by the way, you know what their position is? Their position is let the Israelis stay where they are, one person, one vote. There was an interview last week uh, in Haaretz with Ahmed Tibi, who's an Israeli Arab, a member of the Knesset, and he said, look, one state's okay with me, but when there's one state, the flag won't be a Star of David. Uh, and when there's one state, I'll be the prime minister, Hatikva won't be the national anthem, and he just ticked down. So, you know, Israel's future of whether it's a Jewish democratic state or it's a binational state, at some point requires decisions. No decisions and staying on the same path leads you to a certain outcome. So even though right now there isn't, that, there isn't the kind of debate it's going to come. You know, I'll tell you what would be an amazing wake-up call. You have about 300,000 Palestinians in Jerusalem who have the right to vote in municipal elections but haven't because it was always an argument, if we vote, it means that we're giving up our national identity. If they voted as a bloc, you'd probably have an Arab mayor of Jerusalem. I mean, there's going to come a point where these kinds of facts will be part of the discussion in Israel. Some people are trying to make it now. It doesn't have a kind of resonance yet, but at some point it will. So even though you know, the, the current, you know, I get back to the issue of disbelief. In the last election, the Zionist Union didn't make peace an issue in the election because it has no credibility with the Israeli public, because they don't believe the Palestinians at all. But, there's a, but not becoming a binational state, that, that is something that very well could be a motivator and probably will be. I want, again, I want to get students. You may be a student, but okay, yeah. If we have a responsibility to not accept failure, to not do nothing in Israel-Palestine because of uh, the consequences for the rest of the world, do we have a responsibility to do groundwork in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya, and in Syria as well? Do we have a responsibility? Is that what you're asking? Yes. yes. Different people may answer the question differently. Um, I do feel in a place like Syria uh, that what we have seen there is a stain on the international conscience. And it should be on ours as well. Um, do I feel we have a responsibility to try to stop that kind of, of human slaughter? You realize that it's not just that, that Assad used barrel bombs. You know what the targets were? Hospitals, schools, bakeries. 
by the Russians, the same targets. The Russians went after every hospital. They denied it, but that's what they did. You know, one of the reasons they could do it is because they knew we would do nothing. So, you know, do I feel like we have a responsibility? Yes, I feel like we have a responsibility. I think we failed that responsibility. Um, do I think that we have a responsibility for every place on the planet? No. But where it's clear we can do something and where it's clear there's both a humanitarian and a strategic consequence, it's hard to explain doing nothing. I gave testimony before the Senate during the Obama administration where I thought, I thought I was being very clever. Usually when you think you're being very clever, uh, it never works out. But I thought I was being very clever because I thought I could create an explanation that would drive what are known as the idealists and the realists together. You know, in foreign policy, the realists are those who will never be involved in anything except for our concrete interests, like oil or the economy involved. We won't do anything for humanitarian reasons. And I thought, you know, I, and the idealists are those who say, we'll only intervene for humanitarian purposes. And I thought, boy, I can give a presentation that shows them Syria is a place where they need to do something. For the idealists, the number of people are dying. For the realists, well, you know, the, the outflow of refugees is going, to, is going to undermine the underpinnings of the European Union, a strategic consequence. Uh, and the vacuum that we've contributed to is going to allow ISIS to emerge. Strategic consequence. So there's an ideal reason, an idealist reason to be involved, and a strategic reason to be involved. You know, we can't be the answer to every problem. But where it's clear you know, our own humanity is diminished on the one hand, and where there's a strategic consequence on the other, we should be involved. Yeah. But I'm here, and I'm not in the administration either. Well, look, what's interesting on the Israeli-Palestinian issue is every time he, President Trump has been asked about this as a candidate, uh, after, he was, after he won the election, he was president-elect, and even now as president, every time he says, this is the ultimate deal, he wants to do it. He's assigned his son-in-law prime responsibility in the White House to do it. I can tell you, to be an envoy in the Middle East, the most important attribute is authority. Now, no one will question whether he has the authority. I think the challenge for Jared Kushner and the people who he's working with, and he has put together a small team on this, the challenge for them is to, be, is to, have, the, is to have the time and is to have the kind of um, mechanism where he can be working uh, in an intensive way on this. You know, you, you have to invest in terms of the time and effort. And the importance has to be seen by the parties. In an interesting way, because there's a kind of uncertainty, uh, and I mentioned it in terms of the Arabs, the Arabs are still fearful that maybe Trump will do what Obama did, even though the tone is different, the rhetoric is different. So knowing that, in fact, he will engage on the issues that they see as threats to them provides an interesting lever for him his administration with them. Uh, and you know he has people like Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, who does know the region pretty well, uh, and, and his National Security Advisor, McMaster. They haven't been involved in the Israeli-Palestinian issue, neither one. But they know, you know they have a relationship uh, with the Arabs that is important, that can be part of what I was describing. So uh, Kushner will have the authority which is necessary. The key is you know, having the time and the level of support that allows him to pursue this in a way that, as I said, requires a level of creativity. You know, I once had a, when I first, with, with Ariel Sharon, um, 
We were sitting after the Wye River Agreement in 1998. He was the foreign minister at the time. And he wanted to start thinking through and planning what to do and how to do it on the permanent status negotiations that were about to begin. So he said to me, look, we can't do what they want. They can't do what we want. So let's just do an interim agreement. I said, maybe that's right. But before you make that assumption, why don't we think about creative ways of dealing with some of the issues? So he said, well, take the border. You know, they say 100%, I say 80%. It won't work. I said, that's thinking strategic, uh, that's thinking traditionally. I said, you know, it's not in a negotiation, it's not a straight line where you split the difference. Maybe these are your two positions going in and the answer is out there. And he said, what do you mean? So what if we were to say, I said just theoretically, I'm not saying this is not a proposal, I'm just giving you a theoretical example. What if we were to say, we'll fuzz the image of the border by saying between the Israelis and the Palestinians and Jordanians, you'll create a series of industrial zones. Israel will have responsibility for security in some places, Jordan and other places, uh, and it'll straddle the border. Well, suddenly the border isn't such a clear line. Suddenly it's not a case of, of percentages. I said, maybe that's not the answer. But the point is, you can think, you can basically think at a different level. And you can come up with different kinds of ideas. So to do that, you gotta have the time. You gotta create an environment also where you can be challenging yourself and others to brainstorm in a way that allows you to come up with different kinds of ideas. Got time for one more. See, that was intimidating, really. I have, how do I choose among all these? <laughs> um, all right, actually, you had the very first hand up, so I'll, I'll take you. Would you comment on the um, Ramallah Jordan option and on what's going on in Sinai. Do you mean the Jordan is Palestine option? I don't know what you mean by the Ramallah Jordan option. There's been some effort to have the West Bank team up with Jordan and have one economy, one political option. Right. Um, that's known as the Jordan option. Yes. This was the, the preference of the Labor Party back in the 1970s. Um, there are some people on the Israeli right who say, let's do the Jordan option, but they mean don't give up much of the territory. Um, here's the problem with the Jordan option. Today, probably the most important Israeli security partner is Jordan in terms of dealing with very practical issues. It's the longest border Israel has. Uh, the first problem you have with the Jordan as Palestine option is that Jordan completely rejects it. For them, it's a complete non-starter because it changes the character of the kingdom. Uh, if you actually had it, then you would take a state that currently is a, a state that cooperates with Israel on security in a way that goes to the heart of a lot of Israel's security needs and you'd replace it with a state that would be an irredentist state. That doesn't sound like a good deal to me. Okay. <laughs>